Hey everybody, uh, my name is Nathan for those of you who don't know me. Uh, this is my third official video blog um, and it's actually going to be about the Bible and some uh, scripture um, uh, that talk about a, apparently a controversial subject or topic um, that's in the scripture that I would like to discuss. Um, so for those of you who might not have seen a, a video that I put on my YouTube channel a couple years ago about uh, my st story about how I became a Christian, um, I'm going to link to that in the de into the description of this video, or either I'll make an annotation in that. But just uh, for brevity's sake, um, I, I grew up in the Presbyterian Church. Um, I uh, I was sprinkled as an infant, um, and I guess it was a, a year 2000. I was about 18 or 19 years old. I ended up leaving that congregation or that denomination and uh, found my way involved in the non-denominational Church of Christ uh, which is under uh, which is a part of what they call the restoration movement which is a movement uh, which is which the goal is to restore Christ's church to the original teachings um, that he and the disciples and the apostles were teaching back in those days. Um, so I'm going to prelude with a few things before I actually get into the topic and I'm going to try to talk quickly and concisely because it, I'm going to cover a lot of content. I have a lot of notes in front of me and a lot of open Bibles and open tabs and stuff like that. Um, so this essentially is just going to be a Bible study. It's not going to really be an exhaustive study on the situation, but I do want to um, make a few points and hopefully clear, uh, make, make this topic a little bit more clear for people who are confused. Um, so one of the first things I want to prelude with is um, that the Bible warns against false doctrine and false teachers. Um, uh, the, specifically in the New Testament uh, is what I'm exclusively talking about here. Um, Jesus himself warned about it. Uh, Paul warned about it. And, and just to, to cite a few, uh, I'm going to read Romans 16, 17 through 18. It says, now I urge you, brethren, keep your eye on those who cause dissensions and hindrances contrary to the teachings which you learned, and turn away from them. For, for such men are slaves, not of our Lord Jesus Christ, but of their own appetites, and by their smooth and flattering speech, they deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting. Um, another one is in Galatians. It says, But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. As we have said before, so I say again, Now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you have received, he is to be accursed. And that's specifically a pretty interesting verse because it references if an angel were to bring you a different gospel than what um, what he Paul uh, has already brought to them, and the, you know the first thing I think about with that specific verse is um, Mormonism, how that was allegedly started because of uh, an angel uh, reached out to Joseph Smith, but I'm not going to really go into that any in, in any further detail. Another uh, th there's over a dozen and a half or over two dozen references in the in, in the New Testament alone about false doctrines about false preachers, about upholding truth, about upholding sound doctrine. I'm just going to share a few more. A few more. Uh, here's another one out of Ephesians 4.14. It says, As a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men and craftiness and, de and deceitful scheming. Uh, another one in 2 Timothy, um, 2 Timothy 4.3 it says, For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. Now, now that's a pretty dangerous concept if you think about it, and um, you can almost think of that as cognitive dissonance. Um, another one is in Titus 1, 7, or Titus chapter 1, 7-9. Uh, this is actually talking about overseers and the jobs of the elders and overseers in the church. Um, I'm not going to read the entire thing, uh, but I will. 
Um, I will read verse 9. It says, Holding fast the faithful word which is in accordance with the teaching, so that he will be able to both exhort in sound doctrine and to refute those who contradict. Um, another one in Titus chapter 2, verse 1, it says, But as for you, speak things which are fitting for sound doctrine. Another one in 2 Peter, uh, starting verse 1, uh, chapter 2, verse 1, it says, But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there were also be false teachers among you, who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who brought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. Another one in 1 John chapter 4, verse 1, it says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Another one, Colossians 2, 8, it says, See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tr tradition and the elemental elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. Um, and lastly, a couple ones I'm going to talk about a little bit more in depth. Um, Jesus himself in Matthew chapter 7, I'm going to start in verse 13 and read down through verse 24. It says, Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many enter, there are many who enter it through it. For the gate that is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad trees bear bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then, you will know them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, this is verse 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father, who is, in, who is the Lord, Oh, excuse me. Who, uh, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, this is Jesus speaking, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Uh, and then wrapping up verse 24, it says, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. Um, so I wanted to prelude by talking, by showing that uh, there's ample amounts of scripture in the New Testament of Jesus, of Paul, and other writers warning the saints warning the disciples of Christ, warning the Christians back in that time at the very beginning of the church, um, that there are people out there teaching false doctrine. And here in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus himself says that there are two roads. There's a narrow, there's a wide gate, there's a, a, broad, a broad road that leads to destruction and death, and there's a small road, a small gate that leads to life. And he says that few will find it. So there's a lot of people out there that say, oh yeah, you know, that, 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 that they claim to believe in the Bible or they claim to uh, believe in heaven or whatever. And they'll say, oh, there, there's many ways, there's many ways to get to heaven, right? Well, th that, is, that is not true. That is a contradiction to what the Bible says. The Bible says that Jesus is the way and the truth and the life and that no one will come to the Father except through him. And clearly he right here is saying that only a minority of people are going to find eternal life. Uh, and those are, of course, are for various reasons. Some people just don't want to have anything to, to do with God. They've, they've hardened their hearts against God. Some people are unfortunately following unsound or false teachings. Um, and he goes on in verse 20, 21 to say, you know, these people are doing these various things in God's name, you know, prophesying, casting miracles, 
uh, casting out demons. And the point is, people can say that they are, are disciples of Christ and can be doing various things, whether it's giving to charity or whatever, uh, in, in the Lord's name. But if they aren't a part of God's family, if they are not a children or a child of God, then he says, I'll get away from me. I never knew you. Okay, so, so this is various, very serious stuff that we're talking about. If you're a Bible believing Christian, and um, and you know you're 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 seeking truth, you're open minded, and stuff like this. So this is what I want to um, initially prelude with. So far, the the video is at ten minutes, and this is going to probably be a long video, unfortunately. Um, so the other thing I want to talk about. All right, so so to, to reveal what this uh, video is about, this video is about. The topic of baptism, uh, specifically immersion. Um, if you were to check out the uh, the Greek word um, uh, that, that's used for baptism, it's uh, baptizo, which means to dip, dunk, plunge, immerse, um, and that is the the word that is used throughout the entire New Testament every time um, there's a reference uh, about uh, baptism or immersion. Uh, and like I stated in the beginning of the video. I was sprinkled as an infant, uh, as a child who did not know anything of what was going on. Um, so the next thing I want to talk about is Old Covenant foreshadows or uh, prophecies of baptism or this idea of becoming um, becoming a new creation, so to speak. Um, so th let me see here. That's going to be... Okay, so let, let's go with... Um, Let's go with 1 Peter 3.21 first. So 1 Peter 3, uh, 3.21 is talking about the flood, the great flood in Genesis, right? And how Noah built this ark. And the reason why God decided to build, uh, excuse me, to flood the earth because there was so much violence, sexual immorality, and wickedness going on, uh, which, of course, he detests. Um, he warned the people several times, or many times, um, they they didn't want to have anything to do with them, so he flooded the planet. Right. Um, so verse First uh, Peter three. Um, let's start in chapter. Uh, excuse me. Uh, chapter three. Let's start in verse. Um, let's just start in verse eighteen. It says, "For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the uh, for the unrighteous to bring you to God. He was to put to death in the body." but made alive by the Spirit, through whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who disobeyed long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water, and this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also, not the removal of dirt, from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, powers, and submission to Him. So, when I, when I first read this way back in late 2000, uh, uh, growing up in the Presbyterian Church, I was never really taught about baptism, um, as far as I can recall. And when I started visiting this non-denominational Church of Christ and started having Bible studies with these good folks, they started showing me scripture that I had never read personally and that I had never been taught. And most of these that they were showing me were about baptism. And um, so back to the flood. So the flood is a foreshadow or a uh, symbolization or a prophecy of the Christian baptism. And here we go. So God is... God wiped, cleansed the entire earth from all this, all this sin that was happening. He immersed the entire earth higher than the higher than the, the tallest mountain. And the Bible says that He only left eight righteous people. Well, that is what happens with the Christian baptism, as we're going to read about here shortly. Acts two thirty eight says that you're baptized into the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 4 5 said that there's one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. And that one baptism is to have your sins forgiven, to be made righteous, and to have the Holy Spirit, God, move inside of you. Because obviously, He's not going to move inside of the sinner. You have to be cleaned out and purified first. So, that, so the, the, just to reiterate, the flood 
cleansed the entire earth of all sin um, by, by killing everybody. Just like we die to our old, our old self or our old man when we are buried into the water and we are resurrected from the water just as Christ resurrected and we are made a new person, a new creation as the New Testament writers continue time and time to talk about. So that's 1 Peter 3.21. Another one that I want to talk about was Ezekiel. Let's go to Ezekiel chapter 36 real quick. Uh, starting in verse 25, it says, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove you from I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh and I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and and be careful to keep my laws you will live in the land I gave your forefathers you will be my people and I will be your God so um, Ezekiel as you know is one of the prophet uh, of the books that prophesied just like uh, Zephaniah Daniel Malachi um, and so on and so forth and uh, right, right here he's talking about how he's going to give people a new heart and put his spirit inside of that new people, right? Um, it's actually also talked about again in the immediate chapter, Ezekiel 37. I'm at 16 minutes. Um, Ezekiel 37, uh, basically the first, the first 14 verses, and I'm just going to read a few of them. It's starting in verse 4. It says, then he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will breathe my spirit into you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. And then down in verse 14, it says, I will put my spirit in you and you will live and I will settle you in your land. Then you know that I am the Lord and I have spoken and I have done it, declares the Lord. Um, so that we have these, we have these uh, Old Testament prophecies and Old Testament foreshadowings of, of God um, giving, giving uh, people a new heart in the future, putting his spirit inside of inside of people which was not going on in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, um, uh, the priests were the only one to go into the holy of holy places where, where God was dwelling in the tabernacle. And, um, and of course, nobody, nobody could uh, see the face of, of God. Um, as you recall, Moses, his face was glowing uh, just from seeing the back of God as he walked uh, as he was conversing with God on, I think it was Mount Sinai, there, during the time of the of uh, the Ten Commandments. Um, so, all right. So, where, where do I want to go next? All right. So now, now to bring in some verses about immersion. So, a lot of people say um, that they that they became a Christian and uh, and they never got baptized, or they'll say, yeah, I I. I I got baptized when I was 13 and for all sorts of different reasons, or I, I got baptized when I was an infant like I did, or I, I got baptized when I was 27 because I wanted to join a church, or or because I wanted to make my family happy, or because I just thought it was the right thing to do, right? And uh, for the most part, you know, those are good intentions, but are good intentions um, always the right motives, um, and uh, or are good intentions always... Um, going to lead you uh, to the right path, so to speak, or to the right end game? And, and the answer is no. So the first one I'm going to read real quick is, uh, uh, well, first I'll, I'll mention uh, the baptism of Jesus, where um, Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist, and um, you can see the Holy Spirit descend upon him in the form of a dove. And in my opinion, that's pretty important because that shows that kind of exemplifies what happens when the Christian gets baptized. He receives the Holy Spirit, like it's talked about in Acts 2.38. But um, I, I'm going to mention a, a handful of verses right now that talk about baptism. I'm not going to go through every single one in the New, New Testament for lack of time. Um, but Matthew 28, the Great Commission, it says, um, 
Jesus said, uh, starting in verse 18, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Um, and then Mark, Mark's account of that, Mark 16, uh, 16, or I'll start in verse 15, it says, Jesus said to them, Go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. So that's, that's pretty cut and dry in my opinion. Uh, a lot. Uh, there are some people who I've talked to in the past that say, yeah, but what about the thief on the cross? The thief on the cross was not baptized, but Jesus said that he was going to see him in paradise and his, his sins were forgiven. You know, that's that's a semi-good point. Um, uh, however, it, it, the reason why um, that, that's not really applicable in this situation is because um, Christ's sacrifice had not been made yet. The new covenant had not officially been established yet because the new covenant was established after Christ died, after Christ rose from the dead three days later, and after Christ sprinkled his blood um, on the, the tabernacle um, in, uh, in, in heaven. That's when the new covenant or the new contract, so to speak, uh, was made possible for the generations to come. So the thief on the cross was still under the Old Testament, and God could, God or Jesus could certainly say, "Yeah, I'm going to see you in paradise." Um, the guy clearly had faith and understood or knew who Jesus was, and that's why Jesus said and did what he did. Um, so moving on from Mark six, uh, Mark sixteen sixteen, and, and Matthew, I'm going to go. I'm going to read Acts two thirty eight. So Acts chapter two. Um, uh, Acts chapter 1 talks a little bit about um, ap, you know, Jesus' time on earth after he was resurrected. Um, Acts chapter 2 talks about how Peter was uh, handed the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Um, and his the first gospel sermon ever was preached. And it happened to be preached largely, la largely to the Jews. And um, it was only, if you read it, it was only about a five minute sermon. And I'm going to start in verse, um, well, verse 36. It says, Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. Other translations say that they were pierced to the heart or pricked in the heart. Basically saying that it, 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 their, their conscience, they, they realized that they had sinned against God. They, that they had killed their Messiah. So, um, in verse 37, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter, What shall we do? Meaning, what shall we do to make things right, to rectify things with God? In verse 38, Peter was, Peter's response was, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all of you and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words he warned them and he pleaded with them, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted this message were baptized. About three thousand were added to their number that day. So one point I want a couple points I want to make about this is that first of all. When these people the, these people heard the first gospel message, they were they were they were convicted. Their conscience bothered them. They realized what they had done and what they what they were doing, and they wanted to make things right. Um, so they a, after after Peter told them you need to be baptized, they didn't they didn't question Peter. They didn't say, oh, why do we need to be? At least there's no account of it here. They didn't say, why do I need to be dipped in some water? They didn't they didn't they didn't do anything like that. Um, and there's no other account when people are preaching, you need to be baptized. There's no, there's no account in the Bible saying, oh, why? Why do we need to be dipped in this water? So people need to think about that when they're questioning uh, folks like me or anybody else who are, who are advocating people need to be baptized for the right reasons. Uh, another couple of points I want to talk about as far as Acts 2.38 is concerned. Uh, clearly, um, it's very clear 
repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So obviously we know, people who are literate in the Bible know that God cannot be around sin. Um, and um, Which is why he purifies us, which is why he cle cleanses us, which is why he regenerates us, so to speak. And um, so he has to clean us out before he can move inside of us, which is completely different from how uh, the old covenant worked or the old contract worked worked in the in the Old Testament where um, God wasn't, you know, God, uh, although we know that God lives, he's omniscient, he's everywhere, um, to the people, God lived in this tabernacle, right? So now, the Christian now is that tabernacle. The Christian is described in the New Testament as the house of God, as the temple of God, um, as the sanctuary. Um, these are very important concepts which is why we don't worship God just one day a week on a Sunday for two hours. That's not the right idea. We worship God 24-7 according to Romans 12, 1 and 2. So Acts 2.38 is very clear. We were immersed for the forgiveness of our sins, and then we will receive the indwelling spirit of God, that, end, that also called the helper, the New Testament refers to it. And the Spirit, as Paul tells us in Corinthians, uh, the first and second Corinthians, is a deposit or a down payment guaranteeing our our uh, you know our salvation. Um, so the, these are important things to know for people who are trying to have a sound understanding of Scripture and who want to be sure about their um, their faith and their uh, their own salvation, so to speak. Um, another another couple of verses I want to talk about. Um, uh, so, uh, if you read the Book of Acts, the, the Book of Acts is a great history of the church and all the growth in the church. There's a number of conversions in the Book of Acts, and that you'll see every every conversion there is a baptism that immediately followed with the people believing the message, repenting, and then they were immediately baptized. And I'm not going to go through every single one because we're already at 27 minutes, unfortunately. But I want to talk about a couple. Starting in Acts 8, 35. Let me flip there real quick. 8, 35, it says, um, th So this is Philip on the road. And um, he, he, uh, he was actually instructed by the Holy Spirit um, to go to this chariot. And the Holy Spirit knew that this, uh, that, that this Ethiopian eunuch had an understanding of God, and he was actually reading Scripture, and that's why Phil, uh, the Holy Spirit told Philip to go to this guy to help uh, to help him understand the Word better. Um, so, starting in verse thirty-four, it says the eunuch asked Philip, "Tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else?" And um, it's this whole account starts in uh, uh, Acts chapter eight, verse twenty-six, but I'm starting in here in verse thirty-four. Um, and then go, going on in 35, it says, Then Philip began with that very passage of Scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. 36, As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away. So that, that's just one account of somebody believing the good news, believing Jesus died, was resurrected, um, and was that ultimate sacrifice for, for all the generations to come. Um, another one I want to talk about was Acts 16, the, the jailer, Acts 16, starting in verse 25. It says, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open, and everybody's chains came loose. The jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself, we're all here. The jailer called for the lights, rushed in, and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. 
He then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Verse 31, they said, They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in the house. And that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. They immediately uh, washed their wounds. Then immediately he and all his family were baptized. That's just another account of people believing the gospel message. The gospel being the death, the burial, the life, the death, and the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And one last conversion story I wanted to talk about that really kind of hit home for me is in Acts chapter 19. This is Acts chapter 19, Ephesians 4, 5, and Acts 2, 38 really, really made a huge impact on me when I started first researching this way back in late 2000. Um, starting in verse 1, it says, While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, No, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, Then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. <clears throat> so, so these people were baptized by John the Baptist for the, for the repentance of their sins, and that's what John's that's what John was doing uh, uh, before he ran into Jesus. Was he was building momentum for the cause of Jesus, um, and they realized that they had not been baptized for the right reason. They had been baptized for repentance for the repentance of their sins. But a after talking with Paul here on the road, they realized that, that, that they had not been done for that one baptism, that one reason, as Ephesians 4, 5 talks about, which is the reason found in Acts 2, 38, which they needed to be baptized for the forgiveness of their sins and, as they were talking about here, to get the Holy Spirit, that deposit, that down payment that guarantees the Christian their salvation, of course, if they stay in the faith. And if they stay focused and continue to grow in Christ. Um, so that's that's it for the book of Acts. I, I want to go ahead and move on to, um, to Galatians real quick. Uh, another, another verse that talks about immersion. Um, Galatians 3. I'm going to start in verse 26. You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for all of you are one in Christ Jesus. So it doesn't matter your race. It doesn't matter your gender. It doesn't matter your background. God is not discriminatory. He want, it, the Bible is very clear. He wants all people to be saved. He wants all people to come to repentance. 2 Peter 3 9 says that. He wants nobody to perish, everybody to come to repentance. And the way that we clothe ourselves with Christ, or the way that we put, our, or put Christ on us or in us, it says right here, is through baptism. Um, so uh, the, uh, there's this term, there's this terminology that some, some folks use as far as being born again. Um, the scripture refers to it as um, as a rebirth or as a new creation, right? Um, that's talked about in Corinthians. Paul talks about that in Corinthians. Um, let's turn to Romans 6, 4 real quick. Ro let's start in verse 1, actually. Romans 6, video is at 34 minutes. Good grief. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By, by no means, we die to sin, how long, excuse me, how can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. We too may live a new life.
of course that new life is in Christ um, and I wrote uh, I wrote a little reference next to that which was uh, Galatians 2 20 which I just turned to and it says I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live but Christ lives in me the life I live in the body I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me so I want to play pay particular attention to I have been crucified with Christ right so like I said a few minutes ago the gospel is the life the death the uh, the burial and the resurrection of Jesus how do we obey the gospel how do we become participatory benefactors of that gospel message and it's very clear here in Romans 6 and here in another verse I'm gonna t I'm gonna take us to in a second we participate in that gospel through immersion when we are immersed into the water we die to our old self we die to those sins we are buried just like Christ was buried and we die to our old self just like Christ was died when we raise up out of the water we are made a new person a new creature a new creation we are made that Christian we are resurrected just like Christ was resurrected that is how we uh, that is how we obey the gospel we 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 die to our sins where our sins are washed away and we become a new life that life dedicated to Jesus Christ um, another another verse I want to talk about real quick which uh, is very similar to uh, Romans 6 is in Colossians and um, yeah let's just go ahead and go there we're gonna talk about this for a few minutes actually because this is some very very interesting stuff Colossians chapter 2 I'm going to start in verse 9. It says, For in Christ all the fullness of deity lives in bodily form. And you have been given fullness in Christ who is the head over every power and authority. In him, meaning in Christ, you were also circumcised in the putting off of the sinful nature, not with a circumcision done by the hands of men, but with a circumcision done by Christ. Having been buried with him in baptism, and raised with him through your faith and the power of God who raised him from the dead. So there's an enormous amount of information right here. First of all, under the old law, under the old uh, testament, under the old covenant that God made with his people, people were required to be physically circumcised. There later in the old testament, which I'm going to bring up here in a second, there's actually prophecies of uh, of a new circumcision to come which is the circus circumcision of the heart that circumcision is talked about right here which is that new circumcision is baptism that is when um, you are circumcised of the heart it says um, th this is a circumcision not with the circumcision done by the hands of men leading physically but with the circumcision done by Christ internally Having been how having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him through your faith in the power of God who raised him from the dead. Okay, so let's look at a few verses in the Old Testament that foreshadow or prophesy about this new circumcision. Um, let's turn back to Ezekiel, which we already flipped from once. Ezekiel 36, starting in verse 25. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. And I will remove from you your heart of stone and will give you a heart of flesh. Okay? Right there is prophesying. He's going to give us a new heart. He's going to put a new spirit in us. Okay? Let's turn to Romans 2. That's e that, that was Ezekiel 36, 20 th 25 through 28. Now let's turn to Romans 2, 28 through 29. Okay, here we go. A man is not a Jew if he is only one outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a man is a Jew if he is one inwardly, and circumcised. Or, excuse me. And circumcision is circumcision of the heart, by the spirit, not by the written code. 
such a man's praise is not from men, but from God. Okay, so right there it's saying that um, that the, so the this new so Paul's talking to the Romans, um, and um, he's letting them know that um, circumcision. That old circumcision is done away with. This new circumcision is done internally by God through our faith, of course. Through our faith and through God's grace, of course. We are saved through grace. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10 talk about that. None of us deny that. We all realize, uh, some, some people's concerns are that, that people who advocate that baptism is essential for salvation, is. some people try to say that, oh, we're, we're claiming it's a work, that, that you can earn your salvation through works. And we are not saying that, and and I'm gonna I'm gonna touch on that thought in, uh, here in another second, but right here it says that we are circumcised circumcision of the heart by the Spirit. So let's go back to Colossians, Colossians 11. In Christ you were also circumcised in the putting off of the sinful nature, not with a circumcision done by the hands of men, but of the circumcision done by Christ having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him through your faith and the power of God who raised him from the dead. So it has nothing to do with who is baptizing who because God is the one doing the work in the person. God is the one through the act and obedience of baptism <coughs> that God is regenerating that person, that God is putting a new heart inside of that person, that God is putting his spirit inside of you, that God is cleansing you. But of course, that's only through our faith. It says that right there. Through our faith, God is doing these things. So now back to Ephesians 4, 5, that there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism. If, if you were not baptized for the right reasons, you seriously need to pray about um, pray about this and, and consider getting immersed for the right reasons. Ephesians 4 is very clear. We're baptized for the uh, Ephesians four five is clear. Acts two thirty eight is clear. We're we're baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, and we will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Right here it says that we're buried in Christ and that we're raised with uh, we're, we're raised with Him through our faith in the power of God. So we have to have faith and knowledge and understanding that in our baptism, in that act of obedience, that that is when God makes us a new person, so to speak. That is our rebirth. Um, rebirth, that's talked about in John 3, 5, and Titus, Titus 3, 5. I'm going to flip to John real quick. And this again is Jesus. It says, Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to the Spirit. Now I'm going to flip over to Titus real quick. Titus 3.5. It says, uh, I'll start in verse 4. But when the kindness and love of our God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and the renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that, having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. So as children of God, we are heirs. We are heirs, and we, we, we uh, graciously receive this um this the the salvation that God offers to everyone if we obey um, if we obey the scripture. Um, I think I think there's only really one more point I want to address. So um, yeah, I've talked about pretty much everything I need to talk about. Some just some of the foreshadowing and prophecy of the new of the Old Testament. That refers to this rebirth. That refers to this new this new circumcision. That refers to this new creation of the Old Testament. I've talked about. Um, I've I've gone through some, not all, of the verses about baptism. Um, I've talked about a little bit about the born again concept and the rebirth. I've talked about what the gospel actually is and how to obey the gospel, which is Romans six one through six, Colossians two nine through thirteen. Um, and lastly, I just want to bring up 
Um, a guy named Naaman in 2 Kings. 2 Kings. Second Kings five, I didn't have it written down. So I'm not going to go through the, this entire story because the video is way too long already. But read Second Kings chapter five. Naaman has has leprosy. That all this stuff is eating away as, at his flesh. Um, um I'll just read starting in verse 7. As soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his robes and said, Am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does his fellow send someone to me to be cured of his leprosy? See, how is he trying to pick a quarrel with me? When Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent him th this message. Why have, you why have you torn your robes? Have, have the man come to me, and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha uh, sent a messenger to say to him, Go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be restored and you will be cleansed. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, wave his hand over the spot and cure me of my leprosy. Are not Abana and Far par the rivers of Damascus better than any of the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and, and be cleansed? So he turned and went off in a rage. So you can almost think about this again as another foreshadowing or prophecy of, of um, immersion or baptism, but I'm not going to necessarily take it that far. My point with this scripture is this guy had leprosy. He was told by a prophet, a prophet of God, how to get himself cleansed, which was to go dip himself in the river seven times. The guy got upset about that, which he, he eventually um, he eventually does what he's told, but he, he initially gets upset about it, right? He's like, why do I need to go do this? And my, my point about bringing this up is, do you think, do you think that if he would have tried to do anything else to get cleansed, do you think if he would have gone dipped in a, another river a different river than what he was told? Or do you think if he would have just poured water on his head or sprinkled water on his head or if he would have sacrificed a goat or any other thing, do, do you think if he would have done any other thing other than what God through the prophet was telling him to do that he would have been cleansed? The, that's a rhetorical answer, uh, question and the answer is no. The answer is no. And the reason why I bring that up is be, be, for the purpose of the new covenant, this new contract that people have the opportunity to be a part of with and in Christ. Unless we do things the way that he tells us to do, the way of salvation that's laid out clearly in the Bible, we have to believe our faith comes from hearing, as Romans 10, 17 talks about. We have to repent, as Acts 2, 38, Luke 13, 3, Luke 13, 5, Act, uh, 2 Peter 3, 9 talk about. We have to turn away from our sins. We have to be immersed for the forgiveness of our sins and to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Romans 10, 9 says that we have to confess that Jesus Christ is our Lord. Confess that verbally and confess that through our life and our actions. Because we're not a people of just say as I do, uh, or excuse me, say as I say, not as I do. We have to practically apply the words of Jesus and the words of God that are found in the Bible into our lives. And of course, we have to live a faithful life. We have to be obedient. We have to continue to strive for righteousness. So unless we do these things that are laid out, we are not going to find that salvation that God has given us. And that's the last point that I want to make, bringing up 2 Kings and Naaman. So um, anyway, um, I understand this is a long video. Hopefully that won't be a deterrent for people watching it. Uh, I'm sorry that was long, but this was a very important topic. Um, this is unfortunately a controversial topic, um, and the mainstream, the mainstream church, unfortunately, has it wrong. And that's not my opinion. That's the opinion of Jesus Christ, 
which you can find in Matthew chapter 7. The wide gate leads to death. The narrow gate leads to life. What do we see out here in, 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 the, in the world? We have denomination after de denomination after denomination. Each denomination was, was created by somebody in a certain time period. They were not created by Christ. We all, we all know that Christ is the head of the church. He's the body. Um, we have no right to divide Christ's church. Denomination, the root word of that is denominate. We all know that uh, denominate means to divide. Nobody has the right to divide Christ's church. All denominations have their own creeds, their own catechisms, their own doctrines. None of uh, They're all contrary to what the Bible says. The Bible makes Christians only. If you want to be a Christian, read the Bible. Don't make... Don't read man-made documents. Don't read, don't read man-made doctrines or creeds. Um, so check out the Restoration Movement. Um, and if you have any other questions, if you want to have a personal Bible study with me, feel free to reach out to me. You can find me on my Facebook page, Who is Nate Cox? Uh, Facebook.com slash Who is Nate Cox or Who is Nathan Cox? Those are both of my pages. Um, and I, I hope I hope you like the video. I understand that some of this you might not have thought about. Um, and um, it, again, if you have any comments, feel free to comment below. Reach out to me one on one or personally, and feel free to share the video. All right. And just to recap something I said at the very beginning of the video about how I grew up in the Presbyterian Church and I was sprinkled, I realized all this stuff after I, like I said, after I started going to this non-denominational Church of Christ that was affiliated with this decentralized, so to speak restoration movement that's been going on for for uh, some time now and after I learned this stuff um, the the girl who ended up uh, inviting me to that to that uh, congregation I asked her to immerse me that was January 23rd 2001 we had just got done a Bible study at her parents house so there was a bunch of people there in the youth group um, and I had decided that um, although I had thought that I was a Christian that I, in fact, that I wasn't according to what the Bible says about how to become a Christian. And we uh, went up to the church building and, um, and I got dunked for the forgiveness of my sins and to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That is when I became a Christian. You can pinpoint when you became a Christian. You can pinpoint when you received your salvation. And we have to continue to work out that salvation and continue to stay faithful. So um, that's my story. That's this a video about the the truth about baptism and what the Bible says about it. Um, I love everybody, and I, I pray that people will just stay open-minded, um, search for truth, and uh, the the Bible says that if, if we are searching for truth, um, and we come to that door, that that God will open that door and He will show us the way. So let's let's um let's just do what the Bible tells us. All right.